In 1988, the U.S. Air Force retired the legendary SR-71 Blackbird, the fastest aircraft ever to take to the skies. For years, nothing on Earth could rival its blistering speed. But that era is over. The SR-72 Dark Star, its long-awaited hypersonic successor, is now confirmed to be real. Powered by next-generation propulsion and stealth technology, this aircraft is designed to reach speeds exceeding Mach 6, leaving adversaries like China and Russia scrambling to respond. More than just fast, it's a game-changer, capable of striking anywhere in the world within minutes. So what exactly makes the Dark Star so advanced? And how is it poised to reshape the future of aerial warfare? Join us as we reveal the details of the U.S. Air Force SR-72 that is being tested. During the Cold War, the United States needed eyes in the sky, ones that couldn't be caught, couldn't be shot down, and could uncover the most hidden Soviet operations without ever being seen. Spy planes like the U-2 were already in use, but when one was shot down in 1960, it exposed how vulnerable they were. The U.S. had to go beyond altitude. They needed speed. So Lockheed's Skunk Works, led by the legendary Clarence Kelly Johnson, answered with the SR-71, a jet unlike anything the world had ever seen. It flew at Mach 3.3, over 85,000 feet high, faster than any missile fired at it. If it was detected, it didn't fight back. It simply outran danger. The SR-71 wasn't just fast, it was the most advanced spy plane of its time, constructed primarily from titanium and resembling something from science fiction. Its mission was clear, see everything, get caught by nothing. With a pilot in front and a systems officer in the back, the jet soared at night, its dark color helping it blend into the sky, earning it the name Blackbird. Its sharp design and radar-resistant body made it nearly invisible. And if a missile came its way, it just sped up or climbed higher. The aircraft was primarily made from titanium and strong, plastic-like materials. Titanium was expensive and tricky to use, but it could handle the extreme heat. The wings were designed with special ridges to allow them to expand safely during flight. On the ground, some parts didn't fit tightly, but lined up correctly once the plane heated up in the air. The front window of the cockpit was made of quartz and attached to a titanium frame. The plane often leaked fuel while parked because its parts expanded when hot making the work harder for the ground crew. Red warning lines on the wings showed where not to step. The tires were filled with nitrogen and had aluminum inside. Each one cost 2,300,000 and had to be replaced after about 20 flights. Because the plane landed so fast, it used a parachute to help slow down and reduce pressure on the brakes. Although its design came with many problems, no SR-71 was ever shot down. Obtaining sufficient titanium was also a challenge so the team had to secretly acquire it through other countries, including the Soviet Union, without their knowledge. The Blackbird's body was shaped to avoid radar, with sharp edges and special coatings to absorb signals. Even its fuel had additives to make its exhaust harder to see. However, over time, Soviet radar technology improved and began to catch up with the stealth design. The SR-71's sharp edges near the front, called Chinese, were added later in the design. Initially, they were designed to reduce radar detection, but they ultimately proved to enhance the plane's flight performance. The Chinese developed a swirling air design that enhanced the jet's stability at high speeds and even helped reduce the landing speed. This improvement wasn't planned, but it made the aircraft perform even better. Another key part of the Blackbird's design was its air inlets, special openings that controlled how air entered the engines. These inlets were vital for flying at very high speeds, especially above Mach 3.2, where the aircraft flew most efficiently. Each inlet had a moving cone-shaped spike at the front. At low speeds or on the ground, the spike remained fully forward. But once the plane passed Mach 1.6, the spike slid back, guided by a computer. This movement helped manage shock waves and airflow into the engine, making supersonic flight smoother and more stable. Initially, the plane utilized analog computers to control the spikes. However, these weren't always accurate. When they got it wrong, it caused a problem known as an inlet unstart, where the airflow became unstable. This could shut down an engine or make the plane lurch sideways. Engineers devised temporary fixes, such as restarting both inlets, 
and later implemented a more advanced electronic system that could detect and resolve the issue autonomously. NASA also discovered that the airflow from the Chinese helped improve engine performance, leading to even more updates. By 1960, the old analog system was replaced with a digital one called DAFICS. This made the inlet control much more reliable and improved the plane's overall handling. The Blackbird had two powerful engines called Pratt & Whitney J58. Each could push out 32,500 pounds of thrust even when the jet was standing still. These engines were designed to operate optimally at a cruise speed of around Mach 3.2. At takeoff, only about a quarter of the engine's power came from the afterburner, a system that adds extra fuel for more push. As the plane sped up, the afterburner kicked in more, and by Mach 3, it was providing nearly all the thrust. To understand how the Sirar 71's engines worked, it's essential to know how air flowed through them. First, the air was compressed and heated. Some of this compressed air was directed directly to the afterburner, while the rest continued through additional compression stages, where it mixed with fuel and burned in the combustion chamber. After powering the turbine, the hot air, along with extra air from earlier stages, entered the afterburner for one last boost. At speeds near Mach 3, the heat from air compression limited how much fuel could be used because the turbine couldn't handle temperatures above 800 degrees Fahrenheit. Even though the spinning parts of the engine lost some of their strength at these high speeds, they still kept the air flowing smoothly. At this point, most of the engine's power came from the heat produced in the afterburner. The heat of the incoming air limited the SR-71's top speed. If the temperature got too high, it could damage the engine. To start the engines, ground crews first used carts with two Buick Wildcat V8 car engines. Later, a quieter system using air pressure was developed for main bases, but the older carts were still used at other locations. The plane used a special type of fuel called JP-7. It was hard to ignite, so a chemical called triethylborane was used to light the engines. When TEB was injected, it created a green flash, showing the engines were firing up. During takeoff, the SR-71 carried only part of its fuel. This made it lighter and put less pressure on the brakes and tires. The plane would then climb rapidly and consume a significant amount of fuel. Some believe that early refueling was necessary because the aircraft leaked fuel on the ground. However, the real reason was performance. Maximum speed and range could only be achieved after refueling in the air. For longer missions, mid-air refueling was essential. Special tanker planes such as the KC-135Q were used. These tankers had modified fuel booms that could handle the SR-71's high speed. Inside the cockpit, a special screen helped the pilot stay aligned with the tanker by providing small visual cues about the plane's position and angle. The SR-71 used an intelligent navigation system that looked at stars to guide the aircraft. This system, manufactured by Nortronics, featured a small window on the plane's body that tracked stars to correct any directional errors. Even while flying at Mach 3, it stayed very accurate, only drifting about 1,000 feet off course, as one pilot explained. For its missions, the SR-71 carried different tools. It had cameras that could take wide or zoomed-in pictures, depending on where they were placed on the jet. It also had radar and gear to collect electronic signals. Over time, newer and better systems replaced some of this equipment. To protect itself from enemy threats, the plane was built with electronic defenses. These systems could block or mess up enemy signals to keep the SR-71 safe. Since it flew at very high altitudes and speeds, the crew wore special pressure suits that provided them with enough oxygen and protected them from the extreme temperatures. Regular flight suits wouldn't have been sufficient. The cockpit got extremely hot, so it had its cooling system. For longer flights, the crew had small containers with straws to help them eat and drink while wearing their helmets. Altogether, the SR-71 was packed with gear that helped it gather information safely and effectively. But in 1989, the aircraft was retired. The U.S. Air Force stated that the retirement was due to high costs and the development of newer methods for collecting intelligence, such as satellites and unmanned aerial vehicles, commonly referred to as drones. However, others believe the real reason was political. In 1996, a former commander named Graham said the SR-71 still offered important intelligence that newer systems couldn't match. He explained that earlier leaders had supported the program, 
But by the mid-1980s, many high-ranking officers wanted to focus on newer projects, such as the B-2 bomber. These newer leaders saw the SR-71 as outdated and pushed to shut it down. According to Graham, they convinced Congress with strong arguments, but he believed those claims were more about pushing other agendas than about the SR-71 truly being unnecessary. The Air Force may have viewed the SR-71 more as a tool to help protect funding for other projects than as a priority itself. The top generals didn't fully value the intelligence the SR-71 provided for planning and operations. They believed its benefits were more helpful to agencies like the CIA, NSA, and DIA. Some didn't fully understand the importance of aerial surveillance, and many lacked knowledge about what the SR-71 could do. Promises of future replacements helped fuel criticism of the aircraft. Dick Cheney once told the Senate it cost $85,000 an hour to fly the SR-71, though others gave even higher and less accurate estimates to make it look worse. Even though the SR-71 outperformed the U-2 in speed range and how well it could survive attacks, it had one major drawback. It couldn't send data in real time. Unlike the U-2, the Blackbird didn't have a data link, so all information had to be analyzed after the plane returned to base. This was used as a key argument for shutting down the program. Some felt the lack of upgrades made the aircraft look outdated, which helped others push for new programs instead. While efforts were made to install a data link, some individuals in the Pentagon and Congress opposed keeping the plane in service and blocked those upgrades. In 1988, Congress allocated funds to keep six of the aircraft flying, but the Air Force failed to utilize those funds. The SR-71 flew its last active missions in October 1989, and the program's operations officially ended that same month. By mid-1990, the squadron was shut down. Some jets were sent to museums, while others were placed in storage. In 1993, concerns over growing tensions in the Middle East and North Korea led Congress to reconsider the SR-71. Rear Admiral Thomas F. Hall explained that the aircraft was retired because it couldn't keep up with the fast-changing demands of modern warfare. Commanders now needed intelligence immediately, and the SR-71 couldn't deliver it fast enough. The government believed that new technologies could take over the SR-71's role and better support mission planning and decision-making. Mackey told the committee that they were using U-2 planes RC-135s and other systems to gather information in certain areas, but Senator Robert Byrd and others weren't satisfied. They believed that no aircraft could match the SR-71 and that making one just as good would be impossible with tight military budgets. Congress was unhappy that there was no proper replacement for the SR-71. This frustration even affected how they handled funding for imaging upgrades on the U-2. Initially, they added $100 million to bring three SIR-71s back into service. Later, they cut that amount to $72.5 million. Still, the Skunk Works team managed to return the aircraft to service for just $72 million, staying under budget. Retired Air Force Colonel Jay Murphy led the reactivation. Two other retired Air Force officers, Don Emmons and Barry McKean, assisted in establishing the support system. Active Air Force pilots and reconnaissance systems officers who had worked with the SR-71 before were asked to volunteer for the missions. The planes were assigned to the 9th Reconnaissance Wing at Beale Air Force Base, but operated from an upgraded hangar at Edwards Air Force Base. They were also equipped with technology that could transmit radar images to ground stations almost in real time. Even though the SR-71 was brought back, it wasn't easy. The Air Force hadn't included it in their budget, and developers working on drones were concerned that the money would be allocated to the Blackbird instead. Since Congress had to approve the funds each year, the program couldn't be planned long-term. In 1996, the Air Force attempted to end the program again, despite Congress having previously approved the funding. In 1997, President Bill Clinton used a line-item veto to cancel $39 million meant for the SR-71. But in 1998, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that the line-item veto was unconstitutional. That same year, the Air Force officially requested the remaining SR-71 funds be used for other projects. In September 1998, the SR-71 was finally and permanently retired. NASA flew the last two operational Blackbirds until 1999, marking the true end of the SR-71's legendary career.
Today, most SR-71s reside in museums, except for two aircraft and a few D-21 drones still held by NASA's Dryden Flight Research Center as test assets. For decades, no aircraft could match the SR-71's unmatched speed, altitude, and survivability. But with rising global military threats, especially from countries like China and Russia, the United States now looks to the SR-72, the Blackbird's hypersonic successor. First revealed by Lockheed Martin in 2013, the SR-72 is envisioned as a state-of-the-art platform that may serve not just as a reconnaissance aircraft, but also potentially evolve into the U.S. Air Force's sixth-generation NGAD, also known as next-generation air dominance fighter. Unlike the unarmed SR-71, the SR-72 is expected to carry a formidable array of weapons, from traditional munitions like missiles and bombs, to advanced systems such as laser-directed energy weapons and surveillance drones. It will also feature high-tech sensors and long-range imaging capabilities to provide detailed, real-time battlefield awareness. What truly sets the SR-72 apart is its cutting-edge design and stealth. Drawing from nature and breakthrough aerospace research, the NGAD version of the SR-72 features a tailless, triangular body and internal weapons bays. Its lack of vertical stabilizers is made possible by active flow control, a tech inspired by how birds control movement mid-air. This innovation enhances stealth by reducing the radar cross-section, but it significantly raises costs. This high price tag is reflected in the broader defense spending landscape. The B-2 Spirit Stealth Bomber costs around $2 billion per unit. NASA invested $1 billion into the SR-72's development alone. Meanwhile, the U.S. Congress has already allocated more than $10 billion toward the Air Force's NGAD program over the past decade, and the Navy plans to spend an additional $9 billion over the next five years on its version. The SR-72 is built to cover vast areas using robust sensors and advanced weapons. It can detect enemies, allies, and key locations from a distance, instantly sharing this information with other aircraft. Instead of regular radar, it utilizes innovative skin technology integrated into its body, enhancing its ability to detect objects and communicate with the rest of the fleet. This fighter is equipped with modern laser weapons, powerful guns, fast missiles, next-generation AETP engines valued at over $6 billion, loyal wingman drones, and advanced systems for blocking enemy signals and maintaining connectivity. Even with all these upgrades, the U.S. knows future threats may be tougher, so the SR-72 is built in a way that allows new technology to be added easily over time. With all its features combined, each SR-72 is expected to cost around $1 billion and reach speeds of up to Mach 6, putting it on the edge of hypersonic flight. Meanwhile, in Atlanta, a company called Hermes is developing a hypersonic aircraft known as the Quarter Horse. Remotely piloted, it can reach speeds up to Mach 5.5, just behind the SR-72 and stands out as a potential candidate for future passenger and cargo transport. Backed by NASA and the U.S. Air Force with over $60 million in military funding, the Quarter Horse could reshape aviation strategy by shifting the focus from stealth to speed. It currently offers the highest payload capacity among hypersonic aircraft, making it a strong contender for both military and commercial use. The Quarter Horse is powered by a modified TBCC engine based on the proven General Electric J85. Hermes upgraded the design to handle hypersonic speeds, delivering up to 5,000 pounds of thrust with afterburner. This power could reduce intercontinental travel times dramatically. For instance, flying from New York to London in just 90 minutes. Hermes prioritized simplicity and efficiency in the aircraft's design. It features advanced automation, is reusable, and eliminates unnecessary components to stay cost-effective. The team aims to complete test flights for under $100 million, a remarkably low cost for a project in hypersonic aviation. Thank you for watching. While you are still here, click the link on your screen to check out more of our videos. See you there.